everyone! You're listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And welcome back, everyone, to Humanity of Prologue. Um, oh my gosh, I, this has been a long time coming. I'm very excited to get started. Um, before we jump in, uh, how have you been, buddy? I know it's been <laughs> just a little bit since we've last recorded. Yeah, that's right, uh, because... This is the second episode that we're recording uh, on the same week, and so it hasn't been too much time from our perspective um, since we last spoke to each other. Um, of course, uh, it might be different for those of you who are listening in terms of how spaced apart we are. Uh, so I suppose I don't really have much news to say, but uh, I've been doing well. Uh, things are things are going um, pretty okay for me, I would say. Um, how about you? Yeah, same on my end. Um, not a whole lot to report. Um, I've definitely been working on this episode for quite some time, and uh, I'm definitely happy to see this completed at uh, the start of another journey. Um, this is definitely something new for our channel. So, you know, we're kind of going back to a previously released lecture series and expanding on its themes and concepts. Um, so, we call this season two. Um, but in this manner, this iteration of Humanity of Prologue is going to act not only as a second season, but as, well, a, a much-needed update to the material of the previous series. Now, that's not to say that the first season will be fully obsolete, or sh that it should even be neglected by our viewers in favor of this one, whether they be new viewers or uh, long-time viewers. It simply means that... In the time since its inception and creation, which is coming on, yeah, three years ago, um, not only have anthropologists and other scientists learned more about humanity and its history, but I, as a presenter, have learned more too. And my goal as a science communicator is to provide the best and most up-to-date information available in a way that can be understood by as many people as possible. And if I want to tell many fascinating stories of human evolution in history, well, I have to take what I've made and expand and improve upon it. And so that's what I'm going to do. So for the next 17 episodes, we're going to be exploring the human story through a bit of a different lens. So if you remember back in season one, we traced the long journey of humanity from the origin of primates and the bowels of the end Cretaceous mass extinction event to the dawn and flowering of complex urban societies around the world, and even off into the far future. So the focus of that series was chronological, to tell what makes us human from the story of our past. In season two, we're going to tell what makes us human from the things we've created, and from the cultures and societies that have shaped us. So moving mainly away from paleoanthropology and oh, historical world building, uh, we're going to embrace the field of sociocultural anthropology and the findings of cultural evolution to explore a number of questions. One, just how unique is Homo sapiens compared to our closest relatives and to other animal life on the Earth? Two, how have humans taken the most basic elements of life on Earth, finding a home, finding food, finding companionship, raising the next generation, so on and so forth, and expanded upon them? And then three, what does a comparative look at the history and diversity of world cultures tell us about the human animal? It seems thus that we're once again tackling that age-old discourse, human nature, you know, the concept that Homo sapiens at its most basic form is somehow pre-wired with a set of behaviors that determines how we interact with the world. We had ended the first season by arguing basically against this notion of human nature. Simply put, on the opinion of many anthropologists looking across tens to hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution, many have pointed out that the condition of any one of us is shaped by a multitude of factors environmental, cultural, genetic, familial, and so on. So it wouldn't be accurate to say that humans are genetically programmed to be this way, or humans are shaped by our environment to be this way. It's a very complicated network. And within an evolutionary framework, we come to realize that our relationship to other primates 
and to other organisms is a spectrum. Uh, Charles Darwin wrote in The Descent of Man in 1871, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. Now, he was talking about mental faculties, but I think this can be very easily applied to other venues. Mm -hmm. In essence, then, however you define human nature, you'd probably end up with a definition that just could not exclude other organisms. And, and then the term would become kind of obsolete and unhelpful, right? Like if your definition of human nature is going to include the sea cucumber, well, then why are you going to call it human nature? <laughs> you know? um, so rather than relying on that sort of essentialism, we're going to examine that complex whole of human ingenuity. Why is it? that humans are so behaviorally complex? And how is it that we've developed, maintained, and changed our cultures and societies so much over time? Why are our cultures so complex? And just how creative can we be? So we'll open this series by retracing a few steps from that last season. So we'll bring the story of human evolution from microbes to muchachos up to date and explore the origins of human phenotypic diversity. But then we're gonna shift gears and spend the rest of the series exploring human cultural evolution. So what can we learn about ourselves through our technologies, languages, economies, families, beliefs, arts, and sciences, and from our societal interactions across thousands of years of history? I hope this will be an engaging and eye-opening experience for our viewers, some of who may have yet to be introduced to the enormous rainbow of human cultural diversity across time and place. Um, but before that, however, let's take things back to the beginning. Not, not, not the beginning of our evolution, but to the beginning of the field of anthropology itself. So for this introductory season premiere, we're going to look at the history of anthropological theory and see the path humans have taken towards a better understanding of ourselves. Um, but before we do that, uh, Albert, do you have any opening thoughts before we jump in? Well, it's exciting to see this finally come together. I know you've been planning it and working on it for quite a while now. Yeah, I'm excited to, to see how you pull it off. So I, I of course, um, know about the general outline that you've come up with. But um, yeah, I, I, I haven't actually seen it you know, in, in action for myself. So a lot of this is going to be new to me, too. And uh, I'm definitely uh, coming along for the ride. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll definitely learn together for sure. So let's move on then to our next slide. So, if our collected knowledge of myths, legends, folk tales, and fables tells us anything, it's that humans have been trying to understand themselves for a very long time. We'll discuss the nature of myth-making in a later episode, but these foundations are important early steps towards the science of anthropology. For often, myths and folk tales contain society's understanding of humanity. Now, it's not to say that the purpose of myths and folk tales is to be scientific or necessarily to even explain phenomena like the human condition. That doesn't just seem to be the case. Nonetheless, they are a way to bring the complexity of humanity and the cosmos into something manageable, useful. It's really not, not until the 5th century BC that we find historical records of human beings applying what we can call anthropological principles to their writings. In Greece, following a tradition of natural philosophy, whereby individuals provided materialistic speculations on the nature of life and the universe, as opposed to metaphysical ones, we find Democritus applying his atomic theory on human beings. So atoms, according to him, constitute all things, but have different shapes, weights, and dimensions. And it is the varying of these atomic conditions that could change animal and human bodies and behaviors. Thus, life was always progressing towards better forms, having originally emerged from the moist earth. Humans descended from foraging people in the woodlands, eventually experimenting with their surroundings and thus gaining new technologies and traditions. He wrote, and I quote, Culture is better than riches. No power and no treasure can outweigh the extension of our knowledge, end quote. And we could learn even from the animal kingdom through, and I quote, Strength of body is nobility only in beasts of burden. Strength of character is nobility in man, end quote. Thus, we find Democritus, as early as the 5th century BC, proposing rudimentary concepts of biological and cultural evolution. 
And even though he was only one voice in a crowd of philosophers, his writings still seem to have some meaning even today. At the same time, Herodotus was embarking on another form of inquiry, or history, as they called it. This time to, quote, prevent the traces of human events from being erased by time, and to preserve the fame of the important and remarkable achievements, end quote. While he was not the first Greek historian, and that honor goes to Hecateus of Malaeus, he is the first whose writings have survived down to us. Though he's well known for writing an account of the wars between Iran and Greece, uh, Herodotus also sought to capture a cultural record of contemporary peoples, traveling widely across the known world, from Greece to the Black Sea, to Egypt, to the Levant, and Babylon. His dense writings are full of interesting details about the lives, customs, and technologies of different peoples. Some suspected or uh, known to be falsehoods, but many sense have been confirmed by modern archaeology. In this way, Herodotus has written some of the very first known ethnographies, or accounts of a single society, while also applying naturalistic explanations on his findings, like how cultures could be influenced by climate, geography, or human actions. Though he was not wholly unethnocentric, uh, his writings did play into Iranian prejudices typical of wartime. He did treat his subjects with a fair bit of dignity, explaining their life ways often as plainly and matter of fact as possible. Now, this passive voice, though not without uh, criticism, is a mainstay of classic ethnographic writing. And then there's Protagoras. Now, at a time when democratic principles in Athens were being shaped, the act of listening to many different viewpoints and devising effective persuasive arguments became a new art form, what is known as sophistry. The sophists ultimately valued good social skills and practical information over finding out the definitive truth, which made them really targets for criticism by their peers. Nonetheless, sophists also performed rudimentary acts of anthropology that are well established today. Specifically, Protagoras agreed with other philosophers that the conditions of life, and not deities, could influence human behavior. But he argued further that culture was especially important in doing so for a person's culture shaped how they behaved, and as there were many cultures in the world, different truths mattered to different peoples, and that these truths could change over time. Quote, man is the measure of all things, of the things that are, that they are, of the things that are not, that they are not, end quote. What Protagoras had essentially done was develop an early form of cultural relativism, which argues simply that human society should be understood on their own terms. And if anthropologists want to study other cultures, they must approach them without any of their own cultural perceptions. Otherwise, their understanding would be skewed. We'll talk more about what cultural relativism is and what it is not in a later episode. Classical Greece provides just one fascinating example of how human societies can permit a flowering of intellectual expression. It's not that any one of these men, be it Democritus, Herodotus, or Protagoras, were geniuses in a vacuum. Though they were intelligent and somewhat prescient in many ways, they were the end result of a set of historical circumstances in which the ancient Greek city-states lacked a singular political authority, a singular religious authority, and were able to travel widely and engage with trade across the Mediterranean and beyond. And that sort of atmosphere encouraged a tremendous amount of free thought, which wasn't always tolerated, but could manifest into philosophical ideas that could then be shared or taught to others. It's free thought that was given the potential to rise. So it's very likely that if there ever wasn't a Democritus, a Herodotus, or a Protagoras, perhaps someone else at the same time and place would have developed the same or similar ideas. Of course, indeed, the ancient Greeks did not have a monopoly on free thought or intellectual expression. Societies around the world underwent such golden ages, from China to Southwest Asia to Mesoamerica to West Africa. And the ancient Greeks developed vital ideas in mathematics, natural sciences, and technology, but sometimes those very same ideas were independently invented in other parts of the world. So given enough time, it seems, cultural evolution has the potential to produce genius. Now, let's move to the next slide. Um, for example, let's take a look at ancient China. We have many surviving artifacts from over 3,000 years of Chinese history. And that includes an independent tradition of historical writing. Political leaders in China had court historians whose duty was to record and describe an account of events 
throughout the period of a dynasty's reign. Now, often this was to be a, quote, official account of events, meaning that anything the emperor, you know, did not approve of was to be omitted. And if there was anything that criticized the dynasts, well, the historian could face severe punishment. Still, despite this, some echoes of modern historiography seem to have shined through. In the early 8th century AD, Liu Jinji completed the Generality of Historiography, or Shitong, which was the previous imperial dynasties of China, all the way back to the Qin, uh, were described and how previous court historians came to acquire their reference materials. So it's basically how history is done by historians. Uh, I bring up Xinji because his work, which is now partially lost to us, contained anthropological principles, including a critique of ethnocentrism and an attribution of dynastic change to human factors and not to supernatural agents like the Mandate of Heaven. Like ancient Greece in the 5th century BC, the Tang Dynasty China in the 8th century AD uh, has been considered a golden age. So following the establishment of empiric gains into Central Asia, the culture of Tang China was interwoven with Turkic, Indian, Bactrian, Malayan, Iranian, and Chinese threads. Advancements in printing technology and current literacy and the sharing of ideas across regions, and at least among the richer populace, uh, there was an encouragement of more leisure time. Now, these certainly are ways to encourage an intellectual flowering. And so it was that in China, as in Greece and elsewhere, we see that when humans are given a chance, we will make and remake the world as we see fit. Now, following the expansion of the Roman Republic across the Mediterranean, we can find Lucretius in the first century BC. He was also a philosopher, specifically of the Epicurean school, which valued the pursuit of pleasure over the pursuit of virtue. Of interest to us, however, are his writings, which survive to the present day as a book called On the Nature of Things. Here, Lucretius followed the materialism of Democritus, arguing that the universe follows a set of natural laws and that events happen of their own accord. From formless shapes emerged the stars and planets, which were eventually dissolved and recycled into the sun and the earth, which went through stages of fire to a period of cooling, and then on to life's genesis from the combinations of atomic particles into intelligent matter. Lucretius writes, and I quote, Many atoms in infinite time have moved and met in all manner of ways, trying all combinations. Hence arose the beginnings of great things and the generations of living creatures. Many were monsters that the earth tried to make, some without feet, others without hands or mouth or face, or with limbs bound to their frames. It was in vain. Nature denied them growth, nor could they find food or join in the way of love. Many kinds of animals must have perished then, unable to forge the chain of procreation. For those into which nature gave no qualities lay at the mercy of others, and were soon destroyed. End quote. So, thus, in a rather abstract way, an archaic history of life on Earth, complete with an understanding of extinction. Hmm. And where did humans fit into this? Well, Lucretius talks of earlier prehistoric periods, where humans were foragers who lived in caves, but eventually developed social networks of mutual invention, which eventually led to agriculture, law, marriage, customs, metallurgy, navigation, and cities. And in the time of the early cities, societies rose and fell in cyclical patterns. To quote Lucretius, like runners in a race, they had hand on the lamps of life, end quote, just as it was with all things in the cosmos. It is fascinating to ponder that the ancients seem to have figured out concepts of deep time, biological and cultural evolution, extinction, and cosmology without the benefits of scientific methodology that modern anthropologists and paleontologists have. Though the ideas of Lucretius were not always accepted or even tolerated since his time, they do give us reassurance in the knowledge that human curiosity, even about ourselves, knows no bounds and knows no age. Whatever understanding is lost can sometimes be gained again. Now, early Islamic societies had also fostered golden ages. Uh, the Abbasid Caliphate of the 8th and 13th centuries fostered once such period, uh, when great libraries and academies like the House of Wisdom in Baghdad sprung up and encouraged inquiry into all manners, uh, natural and metaphysical. During the 10th century AD, uh, the Iranian scholar al-Biruni became a polymath, and fostered studies into numerous fields, many for the first time in Islamic society, 
of immediate interest to us are his anthropological writings, which were composed as assiduous and critical works, just the sort of methodologies modern anthropologists have used. For example, his Vestiges of the Past was a historical account of world religions and their customs that Al-Biruni approached with a primarily impartial and almost agnostic perspective. His History of India was essentially an ethnography of the subcontinent, complete with a cross-cultural comparative look between Hindus, Sufis, and the Greek philosophers. And just like modern ethnographers, Al-Biruni devoted himself to participant observation, so he would live with the people and learn their languages and customs. We can see in more recent times the works of the Arab scholar Ibn Khaldun, who lived in the, fourth, uh, the 14th century and survived the plague and served under different kings. In witnessing the horror of the plague and what it did to societies at the time, Ibn Khaldun was inspired to take on historical writing. His Mukaddima is one of the first attempts to merge an understanding of history with cultural and sociological observations to present a new science of human evolution. As Lucretius, we find Ibn Khaldun presenting us with an account of the history of the world, from the formation of the earth to the evolution of plant and animal life, to human beings, which, quote, is reached from the world of monkeys, end quote, who are compared with their descendants through the lens of rational thought and self-reflection. Humans then go on to develop communities and tribes as means of protection, which have the potential to grow through increases in population, which increase labor, which increase luxury and wealth. Now, this concept of asabaya is especially potent in that it places social solidarity as the most important aspect that shapes and forms human communities. Unfortunately, like many historic anthropologists, especially in recent times, Ibn Khaldun was also prone to harmful biases. Mm -hmm. He was a proponent of environmental determinism and argued that climatic conditions could affect not just the culture of a people, but also its character. Thus, his opinion of Black African and Slavic peoples was extremely low. Uh, of course, it doesn't help that these groups were also regularly enslaved by Islamic states at the same time. And thus, we follow a grim tradition in anthropology that begins with Aristotle, whereby slavery and later racist policies and beliefs could be legitimized by research, no matter how faulty the logic and uh, we'll revisit this soon enough. Now, as these previous slides have shown, humans around the world and throughout history have looked to their surroundings and their fellows and developed means to better understand themselves in ways that look suspiciously like archaic forms of anthropology. And indeed, some anthropologists would consider these individuals in Greece, China, Rome, and the Islamic world to be the early foundational members of their fields. And who knows what other people may have engaged in anthropological studies only to be lost the time. We know, for example, that the libraries of Tenochtitlan, one of the great cities of the Triple Alliance or Aztec Empire, had entire buildings and sections devoted to history, philosophy, and nature that may have contained similar insights, but were otherwise nearly completely destroyed by the conquistadors. But the anthropological theory did not stop there. And as the age of European colonization dawned, so too were new ideas about humanity that would play a role in shaping the future of the field. But before we move on, Albert, do you have any comments about the ancient anthropologists? Well, uh, this has been very illuminating. Uh, it is always interesting to go back and look at uh, what early thinkers thought of certain topics, uh, because by, like you've gone over, it, it is really interesting to see the glimmers of concepts or methods that are now widely accepted um, and used today um, already reflected in the thinking of these people. I think it's really easy to look back on kind of earlier uh, forms of thought and talk about all the things that they got wrong. And of course, uh, I'm sure they, there was plenty of that. Um, but also kind of reflects the fact that, yeah, you know, people back then weren't any less intelligent than the people today. Um, they might have had access to less information, but uh, they could certainly come up with some uh, very similar concepts about the world uh, that would end up uh, being supported by, by evidence. Um, and that, that is always really fascinating to see. And as you say, these people, too, were really 
they were kind of building upon the foundation of those who came before them and their their own uh, societies that they lived in as well. Uh, so really, a lot of these, um, I suppose, should be more accurately described as just the the earliest um, records of of such thinking. And uh, it doesn't mean that there there weren't even earlier people who came up with similar ideas. Um, so it's, you know, I, I think uh, I I think that really. Uh, puts in perspective, you know, <laughs> how how much we we stand on the shoulders of the people who came came before us, um, and the fact that it happened all over the world, kind of independently too. Uh, that's that that's also uh, very much worth noting, um, and of course uh, they certainly held some beliefs that were incorrect or harmful, um, just just as probably we we do today uh, and in the future. I think some some of the things that we we think of. Um, as being logical um, or plausible uh, will, will also be overturned uh, by future thinkers and researchers. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of kind of fascinating to see that cycle, uh, you know, continue continue to move forward. <laughs> of course, it really puts things in perspective. Now let's uh, let's move on to our next slide, and so we have the philosophers of medieval Europe, which were influenced by Christian beliefs. Uh, they deemed humanity as inherently sinful and having fallen from grace and without harmony to the greater cosmos. While knowledge was argued to be found in scripture, there was a sense in the air that human history was important and that it was universal. So, in a sense, philosophers at the time were also thinking about humanity in more holistic terms. And that's not to say that all pre-anthropological thought in Europe was destined to be this way. Uh, we can note at least Thomas Aquinas, writing in the 13th century A.D., who argued that knowledge was not limited to the texts of the Bible. People could know about the mind of God through the study of nature. And, and people, far from being just sinners, were still beings capable of reason, which should be seen as a gift. So from Aquinas's philosophy came the school of scholasticism, and over time the struggles of philosophers to reconcile every observation with the Holy Scripture led to divisions in thought, with some preferring to stick with what we would call scientific methodologies, regardless of what they told. Thus, finally, in medieval Europe, as in elsewhere, anthropological methods and theory could take root. Now, the next big shock came from the voyages of the Portuguese and the Spanish that brought the discovery, or rather rediscovery, of the Americas to Europeans. While there were natural mysteries to people regarding the outermost boundaries of the world, there was a sense that most of the land's surface had already been explored, and yet here were these two huge land masses supporting millions of people with an enormous variety of lifeways. And over time, Europeans happened upon the totality of Africa, and then Australia and the Pacific Islands, and all their diversity of peoples. So how could you reconcile all of this with the wisdom of the ancients, let alone the Bible? Well, Europeans tried. Now, some argued that these newly discovered peoples, uh, Amerindians in particular, had nothing to do with human uh, humanity in Europe. Uh, they were just too different in appearance, in mentality, and in culture. And so attaching the doctrine of natural slavery that had previously taken hold in Rome and then medieval Islam, some European philosophers argued that humanity descended from different stocks, with the varied races of people that Europeans typified having their own singular origins. So thus, Adam and Eve could be thought of as only the ancestors of Europeans, but not, say, Amerindians or Africans. Now, these came to be known as the poly polygenists, as in polygenesis. But others saw the same shared humanity in these peoples through their reading of Scripture. For all the Bible had said, all peoples descended from the children of Noah, not some. Now, these philosophers argued for monogenesis, a shared common ancestry of all humanity. And their rationale for all the observed differences in appearance and culture were simply consequences of nature. Uh, Bartolome de las Casas and Jose de Acosta, uh, Spanish philosophers in the 16th century, turned natural slaves into natural children, essentially infantilizing these new peoples as potential servants for Christ, who only needed to be civilized and converted to be saved. Now, while the debate about monogenesis versus polygenesis lingered on for many centuries, the question of natural slavery versus natural children nonetheless played its ugly head during all that time. And so great swaths of the Earth's peoples were subjected to colonial practices that decimated their populations, their beliefs and customs, and their lands. 
by the time of the European Enlightenment, dated to mainly the 18th century, the nature of humanity and these new worlds continued to be hotly debated everywhere. Following the establishment of modern scientific principles like concepts of deduction and induction, philosophers tried to understand humanity through natural mechanical laws, just as gravity and the motions of the stars and planets were being understood. This was combined with John Locke's speculations on tabula rasa, or the blank slate of the mind, which had implications for the understanding of culture. Humans, he argued, were born with open minds and eventually learn and shape their identities from their surrounding communities and cultures. And this process could change even as a person grows up. Enlightenment philosophers took these principles, the blank slate and natural laws, and ventured into these new worlds with a new way to understand human diversity. Uh, some, like Joseph Lafitau, uh, wrote cross-cultural analyses of Native Americans and the early peoples of Southwest Asia and Europe. Others, like Lahanchin, engaged in dialogues with Native Americans and gained perspectives on cultural ideals and political authority. Inspired by these concepts, Jean-Jacques Rousseau developed the romantic concept of the noble savage in his 1751 essay, Discourse on the Origin and Foundation of Inequality Among Men. His thesis, which was directly inspired by Amerindian lifeways, was that the earliest humans were peaceful and egalitarian, living in a state of nature within small families with the most basic yearnings for self-preservation like other animals. It was only when people began to settle in larger communities like villages and towns with governmental leadership and developed concepts like self-love and private property that discontent was sown, eventually leading to warfare and inequality. Now, needless to say, this was an inaccurate look at forging peoples then, as it is now, but it did prove to be vital in the following centuries of anthropological discourse, as scholars compared it to the earlier writings of Thomas Hobbes, specifically his Leviathan of 1651, in which he argued the opposite. Civilization and government made life so much better for people nowadays as compared to the past, when human communities were in a free-for-all of violence with each other. So the classic quote goes, the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. For those who remember my review of The Dawn of Everything by anthropologists David Graeber and David Wengro, this duality debate doesn't really do us any good when trying to understand the life ways of prehistoric peoples, mm. but it nonetheless you know, was the type of debate that framed many influential anthropologists. Um, do you have any comments, Alfred? Things are kind of getting ugly here. <laughs> um, uh, and on, on some level, you know, the, these are people trying to understand uh, the world when, when, they, when they come across information that requires them to uh, shift their world views. But uh, I think it's, uh, it cannot be understated how, um, how harmful these lines of thinking have been. It's definitely a, a relief that, uh, that we are moving past many of these early ideas. Oh, certainly. Um, definitely the discourse with you know, the noble savage versus nasty, brutish, and short humanity um, I think is beginning to wane, um, especially in academic circles. We're starting to see, finally, the last vestiges of this kind of get shook, shaken off as new research is done, and uh, I think that is all to the good. Now, uh, let's move to our next slide. And as the age of political revolutions progressed in step with the Enlightenment in America and in Europe, the philosophy on humanity took on a likewise nature. There was more emphasis on the study of social relations and how social change happens across societies. In Germany, for example, the fluid concept of Volksgeist, the spirit of the people, was a result of the struggle for German nationhood in the late 1700s and would directly inspire the methodologies of both the German and American schools of anthropology by framing conversations about society and culture as unified ideals. And then there's Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, whose writings in the 1800s gave socialism a defined political philosophy. The relevance of their writings is all too important to the history of anthropology, especially for their theory of dialectical materialism, as named by Joseph Deitzen. Basically, dialectical materialism is a model for understanding human history. 
As the cosmos is always in a state of change, so too is human social evolution. And everything is connected together and affects each other. Thus, people have a relationship with the things they create in the world, which in turn affects how they view the world, make meaning, and choose actions. So over time, as their method of making a living, what is known as the means of production, changes, so do the people in their relationship to these things. Now, this is a direct contrast to earlier ideas in which human thought and consciousness were supposed to affect human actions and behaviors. When applied to the scope of human history, Marx and Engels saw Rousseauian aspects to human prehistory. They agreed with the concept of the noble savage and expanded on the idea of early peoples having no private property and all being egalitarian as, quote, primitive communism. In time, this system changed into the system of class distinctions, supervised and controlled by the state, which helped the ruling upper classes in power. Ultimately, the means of production shifted from being owned by everyone to being owned by these few. Ergo, primitive communism became feudalism, became capitalism. Ultimately, this narrative of human history was supposed to naturally end with the overflow now, the overthrow of capitalism by socialism of some form. Marx and Engels figured this social revolution would come to the lower classes in Western Europe. Now, while the political ramifications of these ideas have their own long history, the relevance to anthropology was in the methodology. It doesn't seem very irrational to view human social evolution as tied to changes in technological use, and in the collection and cultivation of resources. And in a larger sense, the materialism of Marxism has clear antecedents as far back as antiquity, as a mentality of approaching anthropology without biases from any specific theology. It wasn't until the 1930s that small groups of anthropologists truly began to embrace Marxist philosophies. Structural Marxists, for example, theorized that overruling ideologies directly affected economic systems while instrumental Marxists theorized that the shared class background of powers in government affected economic systems. In many ways, these subfields merged with, with other schools of anthropological thought in Europe and America and remain influential to many scholars and their work, though for most of the full scope of dialectical materialism as a model of history has since been whittled away thanks to the Cold War. Importantly, it was the Cold War and the era of McCarthyism in America uh, that meant that very few explicitly radical Marxist anthropologists have come to us from the 20th century. In this atmosphere, many anthropologists were recruited by their governments to conduct research and basically hand deliver their results to overseas intelligence gathering programs to be used however they saw fit. Now, this has cast yet another unfortunate shadow over the field of anthropology, especially in recent years, as it signifies a justifiable breach of trust between anthropologists and the communities which allowed their research. Now let's move on now to our next slide. And uh, as the European Enlightenment and Age of Revolutions occurred, natural philosophers were rediscovering the concept of deep time and the changing earth and its life forms. Or at least they were feeling more comfortable discussing these things in contrast to the ideological hold of holy scriptures that the Christian churches had established long before. The idea that the earth and humanity was old, like older than scripture, had creeped back into human or at least European consciousness by at least 1655, when the French Calvinist Isaac Lapierre published his book, uh, A Theological System Upon That Presupposition that men were before Adam. He was commentating on the numerous thunderstones that had been unearthed in Europe that had only recently been argued to be human-made tools following the initial explorations of the Americas where populations there were still using stone tools of that type. Uh, Pierre theorized that the people who made these implements were free Adamite and that the Genesis story must only describe the origin of the Hebrew peoples. Intriguing ideas, but unfortunately he was a victim of the Inquisition, and his book burned in Paris. As the geologic record of the rocks was being documented and understood, philosophers made more attempts to reconcile Genesis with their findings, 
In one example, English theologian Thomas Bernays' 1691 book, The Sacred Theory of the Earth, he tried to argue that the various rock formations, mountains and valleys, were the result of Noah's flood, having broken into what was an otherwise perfect spherical Earth. In 1696, his contemporary, William Whiston, wrote a new theory of the Earth and proposed that the genesis of the Earth was influenced by clouds of dust, left over by passing comets, which formed a perfect sphere and was seeded with water from a second comet. And a third contemporary, Gottfried Leibniz, anticipated ideas about the early Earth being molten and hot, only later cooling, and that earthquakes, much grander than had ever been seen by his own contemporaries' eyes, shaped the landscape in the distant past. And soon people began to systematically document the observations that the remains of marine organisms were being found in places far from the oceans. In time, these mergers of theology and science resulted in two competing schools of philosophy. There were Neptunists, who argued that the world began in water and was later receded to reveal land, as per the Genesis story. And there were the Vulcanists, who argued that instead, volcanic activity had pushed up the land from under the water. Both schools had some merit to their theories, and it was a Scottish naturalist, James Hutton in particular, who provided two key observations for the Vulcanist school. In his 1795 book, Theory of the Earth, he noted that, one, rocks formed in different ways, with some forming from volcanic activity and some from the solidification of sedimentary layers on the sea floor, and two, weathering and erosion played roles in shaping rocks. He observed Hadrian's Wall in England and questioned how it could be that if the Earth was 6,000 years old, as per the Usher chronology, then why hasn't this man-made structure felt the intense bows of weathering in 2,000 years that was supposed to explain the presence of mountains and valleys? And he observed that some rocks were insoluble, so the creation couldn't be through the actions of water. It must have been through the actions of intense heat. Thus, Hutton proposed, the Earth must be significantly older than 6,000 years, and that geologic processes must ultimately stem from heat within the Earth, which must be molten, explaining where the lava from volcanoes originates. So by the 1830s, enough evidence had been gathered that another Scot, Charles Lyell, published a geological theory that would be known as uniformitarianism that combine aspects of the Neptunist and Vulcanist schools. In his Principles of Geology, Lyell linked phenomenon of the present day, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, weathering by wind and water, and argued that these processes occurred in much the same way in the distant past, taking a very long time to sculpt all the geologic structures we see today. The opponent school, fashionable with clergymen, was catastrophism, that saw Earth as young and shaped by rapid, violent catastrophes, like Noah's Flood. So clearly, despite mounting evidence of the Earth's geologic antiquity, there were still opposing schools that clung on as desperately as they could to the Genesis story as literal fact. But evidence for the Earth's biological antiquity was mounting too. Now, much credit is given to Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace for co-discovering evolution by natural selection in the 1850s, but it's well known that there were antecedents to these studies. In fact, it's been argued that the, quote, fact of evolution had been discovered long before its mechanisms had been. Uh, a French naturalist, Benoit de Malier, speculated in his manuscript, uh, Tialamed, written between 1722 and 1732, the title is his name spelled backwards, <laughs> that land animals originated from marine animals. Now, he was a Neptunist and argued for an Earth that started with a global ocean that later receded. But he went as far as to calculate the rate of mountain building that told him that the Earth needed to be over 2 billion years for these processes to lead to the present day, which also provided plenty of time for animals like flying fish to turn into birds <laughs> or mermaids to turn into humans. It, it's a bit weird, but the basic ideas were close to the mark. Uh, German philosopher Immanuel Kant, writing in the 1700s, did not speculate on evolution per se, but he did consider the question of species. Now, Linnaeus had already devised his system of nature in which he provided the first binomial names for plants and animals, but Kant argued that the concept of such discrete immutable species, as Linnaeus understood them, 
was probably an error of human judgment, and that when the deep past is considered, it will be made clear that all organisms, including humans, would share lines of descent to common ancestors. Uh, Comte de Buffon also provided a challenge to Linnaeus in his 36 volume work, Natural History, which began in 1749. He devised his own animal classification, but he stressed that species were likely not immutable and that species boundaries would be fuzzy, even going as far as to argue that the line between plant and animal would probably be fuzzy too. And as described by a uh, science author, Gertrude Himmelfarb, quote, species, he said, progressed and degenerated by the favors and disfavors of nature, by changes in land and sea, food, climate, and other prolonged influences to which they were subject, formed upon no original, special, and perfect plan, hmm. end quote. He allowed the possibility of apes and humans sharing common ancestry, though he did not make the leap that human language and intelligence could emerge by nature, instead proposing a creator and planting a soul in early humans to provide these things. Well, you win some, you lose some. So clearly by Darwin and Wallace's time, the air was ripe with evolutionary speculation. Even Darwin's own grandfather, Erasmus, was writing about evolution, as seen in his book, Zoonomia, from 1794 to 96. Although, according to Darwin's biography, uh, he never claimed inspiration from the book, despite having read it twice as a child. And then, of course, there was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who had been, you know, he's, he's been typically seen by historians of evolution as the one who got it wrong for writing seriously about the idea that organisms had a driving force that pushed them to evolve through the use or disuse of features, as seen in his famous giraffe example. The idea was not unique to Lamarck, but it had been floating in the air for some time. Now that said, Darwin did claim much inspiration from Lamarck. He compared him to James Newton. And nowadays, evolutionary biologists have observed and described phenomena that, in very small ways, resemble Lamarck's ideas, notably concerning epigenetics, so perhaps it isn't wise to discredit Lamarck too much. Now, in time, the antiquity of the Earth and life would be better established as more evidence poured in, and eventually the authority of Genesis' account as a scientific explanation gave way towards the geologic time scale. But of course, this is only the backdrop for anthropology. Now all that was needed was to fit human beings into the story and reveal their antiquity. So, uh, Albert, I'm kind of going a little bit into your territory. Uh, I'd love to get your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely more familiar um, ground for me. Uh, and uh, I think you did a very good job of describing the, the different uh, schools of thought that were around at this time that kind of now give us the foundation of our understanding of uh, deep time and the history of life and the earth. Obviously, we... Um, have made quite a few modifications uh, to these ideas since then, but there there is a reason why the these particular individuals are often thought of as where it all started. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's move on now to our next slide. And uh, as stated earlier, European naturalists had been finding early human implements since before the age of colonization. And it was only after that they began to make the connection that these are indeed shaped tools by human hands from some bygone age. Now, this soon led to a general study of antiquities, artifacts from ancient societies, beginning in Denmark and then spreading to other European countries. By finding and collecting, stealing, and describing artifacts from ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, scholars could now supplement their study of surviving classical texts and develop a more nuanced understanding of the past. So beginning in 1816, Christian Thompson, the head of one of the early Danish antiquities museums, devised a three-age system for classifying artifacts in a clear, relatively dated historical chronology. So we have him to thank for the recognition of a Stone Age, a Bronze Age, and an Iron Age. Hmm. And he recognized that material cultures had changed over time in places like Europe and the Middle East. This is a direct descendant of the line of thought that Lucretius used in ancient Rome, and is considered the start of the modern study of cultural evolution. Now, that three-age system was further refined through incipient archaeological work, revealing that some regions underwent a Copper Age as well, uh, as well as dividing the Stone Age into an Old Stone Age, or Paleolithic, and a New Stone Age, or Neolithic, the latter marking the beginnings of agricultural activity and polished stone tools. As before, 
uh, these periods had managed to be fit within the Genesis framework. But eventually, in parallel with the studies in Earth antiquity, people began to accept that human history was probably older too. Charles Lyell, in particular, also wrote about human prehistory. In his 1863 book, The Geological Evidence of the Antiquity of Man and Subsequent Editions, he documented the growing evidence that human beings had coexisted with long extinct mammals in the recently discovered Ice Age, including the discovery of a mammoth tusk at La Baudeline in France that had engravings on it of the animal itself. John Lubbock, who was actually mentored by Charles Darwin, writing only a few years later in his books Prehistoric Times and The Primitive Condition of Man, was one of the first to connect the study of prehistoric peoples to the mounting records of peoples being discovered by Europeans around the world in his time. Lubbock and others argued that modern human institutions, and to them European societies represented the natural pinnacle of social evolution, had developed from earlier ones, and this change occurred in all levels of culture, including religion and morals. These stages were argued to still be seen in contemporary indigenous peoples, as described by European colonists, and their life ways were thus classified into distinct stages that would evolve in sequence. Thus, you have savages, or foraging peoples, barbarians, or agricultural nomads and tribal peoples, and the civilized peoples who had cities writing and central forms of government and administration, with clear definitions for each based on changes in technology and modes of economy. And this is the start of what anthropologists refer to as classic cultural evolutionism, and it led to an explosion of new uh, anthropological literature. One such early anthropologist was an American, Lewis Henry Morgan, who did his early field work with the Haudenosaunee, or the League of the Iroquois, and wrote about his experiences in 1851. Morgan practiced law and used his credentials to help establish native land claims in different court cases, actions which helped engender him to the League to the point where they even adopted him into their nation. Morgan was interested in the study of kinship, and by expanding his studies across North America and the wider world, he was able to devise a framework for how kinship could evolve over time. He noted that all kinship types could be divided into two categories, classificatory, which combines kinship terms into larger groups, so a father could be used to refer to not just one's own biological father, but to also his brothers and cousins, uh, and descriptive, which seeks to split apart kinship terms into smaller groups. So in that case, father would only then refer to your biological father, whereas your father's brothers would be uncles, and so forth. The relevance of this to classic cultural evolutionism was that Morgan established his kinship studies in evolutionary theory. He argued that the earliest peoples in the so-called savage and later barbarian states first used the classificatory kinship terminology, and only as they became civilized developed descriptive kinship terms. He also went further and argued that kinship had evolved from a matrilineal stage to a patrilineal stage as societies became more civilized, and that marriages had developed from uh, consanguine brother-sister arrangements to those with prohibitions against incest and towards the monogamous nuclear family of Morgan's own culture. His writings culminated in his landmark work, Ancient Society, that he completed in 1877. Now, another anthropologist of this cultural evolutionism school was an Englishman, Edward Tyler, whose primary studies occurred closer to home. So while Henry Morgan had done field work, he also kept extensive correspondence with other anthropologists and missionaries and others to get further information on more distant peoples from his hometown. Edward Tyler worked completely from home as what you could call an armchair anthropologist. Hmm. He amassed an extensive library of information and studied it in a cross-cultural comparative style. His 1871 work, Primitive Culture, is the culmination of his work, not only describing cultural traits and determining which ones were adhesive or shared between different societies, he also gave the first modern scientific definition of culture, which he called, and I quote, that complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society, end quote. So right away, one sees the power and importance of this definition, for it centers culture firmly on human customs and institutions, and links its acquisition to fellow humans within the same group. These were the units that did the evolving in a cultural evolutionism.
And Tyler, along with a contemporary researcher, James Fraser, looked especially at the evolution of religion. Like Morgan, they classified human religions into an evolutionary scheme, including animism, which became shamanism, which became ancestor worship, which became polytheism, which became monotheism. And argued that each developed from one another over time as societies evolved from savage to civilized. Now, it's at this time that a number of similar works were published where authors would amass a number of observations from around the world and throughout time to see how cultures may have evolved. We see this in William Sumner's Folkways, which is considered a pioneer in the study of sociology, um, uh, who developed the concept of mores, or social norms. Uh, we see this in Johann Bakofen's Mother Right, which explored how matriarchy changed over time. We see this in Peter Kropotkin's Mutual Aid, which emphasized the role of shared cooperation and natural selection among humans as well as other animals. And we even see this with Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man, mm. which included many chapters looking at aspects of culture and behavior in an evolutionary context. And of course, is notable for his coining of sexual selection to explain human diversity. Now, classic cultural evolutionism is considered the oldest school of modern anthropology, and so became the predominant way of thinking about human societies for much of the 19th century. But other anthropologists didn't like to apply too much evolutionary theory to human cultures, hmm. and some just didn't like it at all. We're at much the same time as that cultural evolutionists were theorizing, often in armchairs. Hmm. Others were actually out in the field, connecting with the peoples they studied and understanding them in new and different ways. Um, do you have any thoughts at all? Oh, uh, I think it's definitely interesting to see ideas from evolutionary biology uh, now now that they're around uh, being applied to uh, studying anthropology and um, including um, or even especially to human culture and not just you know the origins of humans themselves um, it is quite interesting not only the fact that they they are studying this topic but also uh, you can you can see how different investigative methods are being applied in um, similar ways to how they might be done today. Uh, so you have some people who are going out and doing field work and collecting primary data um, and doing a lot of that, but uh, also people who kind of uh, look over data that other people have collected and uh, synthesize or, or, or analyze that data and coming up with ideas based on that. Um, and that is still something that very much still happens uh, today. Um, and both can give rise to very valuable pieces of research, for sure. Um, and it is also interesting um, to hear that uh, there was pushback against applying these concepts um, to human culture, uh, and understandably so. Right. And it's interesting to consider that, I definitely like to echo what you said, like, there's no, it's not to say that the armchair method has no value at all. Um, Clearly, nowadays, we've seen a rise in those sorts of studies where they're synthesizing data that have, been out, that have been published out in the field, particularly from ethnographies, simply because the conditions that the people that were being studied that inspired those, you know, those initial ethnographies are different nowadays, in, in some ways tremendously so. And so you can't really go back and get new information necessarily by studying the people themselves because they've changed significantly since that time. So it, it makes sense to follow that sort of logic today. Mm. It certainly seems that the, the big pushback against the cultural evolutionists during that time, like through the researchers who were going out into the field, certainly had a lot to do with the extreme lack of cultural relativism that was being applied mm. to the researchers at the time. Because again, you have, you know, savage to barbarian to civilized. There's not exactly flattering terms. Right. Uh, describing people who many of these other anthropologists who are actually like, living with them and communicating with them and even establishing friendships uh, clearly didn't match what these people in far off places were saying about them. And so that certainly makes sense in that context. And uh, we'll explore a little bit more about that as we continue on through this series. But uh, for right now, let's jump to our next slide and uh, let's go to Europe in the late 19th century, where we have two schools of anthropology that became established. There was a French structural anthropology, and a British social anthropology. And each was defined by the approach to studying culture as part of a wider system of human sociology. Now, structuralism is a scientific approach that starts with the foundational structures of human mentality and works out how 
these shape and influence culture at higher levels. You know, why do humans behave and act as they do? The French sociologist that was the key to founding this school was Emile Durkheim. As he started work as a school teacher, he developed theories of religious solidarity that culminated in a number of books, including his landmark, The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life, in 1912. In this work, Durkheim sought to understand how religion could create and maintain cohesion within social groups. And he worked with the conviction that Aboriginal Australians, in particular, could provide key insights, as he believed their religious beliefs were especially ancient. Uh, his use of elementary forms to describe these religious beliefs were not based on cultural evolution, however, but instead referred to the origins within societal groups. So to him, religion was a collective consciousness of the group, made manifest by morals and ritual. And it is through these morals and rituals that beliefs are given persuasive reality and thus become established as traditions. Now, his thesis could also be applied to other aspects of society, too. Now, others of the French school include Max Weber, who was a German sociologist. Now, he critiqued Durkheim's work by implying that the French sociologist had turned his studied peoples into, quote, homogenous drones that picked up cultural behaviors almost mindlessly. Now, that's a harsh criticism to be sure, but Weber himself sought to tweak Durkheim's model, at least, um, but emphasized the power of the individual in creating social meaning. Now, this agency was described in his 1922 work, The Sociology of Religion, that was printed actually after he died. He argued that cultures changed over time because specific historical events and contexts occurred. So in contrast to Durkheim's collective consciousness creating culture, individuals were more important in creating culture that was then spread and shared by others on their own whim. Now, Durkheim also played a role in founding the British School of Social Anthropology, which not only focuses on the structuralism of the French school, but also on functionalism, which studies how different aspects of, of a single society work together to contribute to the function of that society as a whole, hence the name. Durkheim, in particular, was influenced by a British anthropologist named Alfred Radcliffe Brown. Working into the 20th century, Radcliffe Brown became known for his work in the Andaman Islands, with Aboriginal Australians and with various groups in Africa, in particular studying the various roles that people played in their communities and what this could tell about a society's history. Radcliffe Brown believed that all history was conjectural and that in the absence of written documents or inscriptions, one could never truly know the intricacies of a society's history. Therefore, he sternly rejected evolutionary ideas in anthropology and instead expanded upon his mentor Durkheim's ideas about social cohesion into a more systematic and scientific approach. And he then inspired another British anthropologist named Edward Ivan Evans Pritchard, who took this and applied it to the newer people of present-day South Sudan. Now, through that combined work, Radcliffe Brown and Evans Pritchard formulated a model which argued that the very traditions of peoples around the world were maintained by ritual practices and other institutions, and that their function is what maintained the entire society and kept it alive. Just like individual organs work together to keep a body functioning, so too did every single ritual and practice, no matter how small. Now, Bronislaw Malinowski, a Polish anthropologist, is credited with co-founding the British Social School. His primary contribution was to expand and modernize the role of ethnography in answering questions about human cultural behaviors. And he is well known for his masterful study of the Trobriand Islanders of Northeast New Guinea, uh, Argonauts of the Western Pacific, which was published in 1922. Through his ethnographic work, Malinowski developed a model on studying culture that could be used for any anthropologists anywhere in the world. So according to functionalism, all aspects of a society are related and play off each other. If one part changed, then necessarily the parts connected to it would change too, sometimes in small ways, but with the potential to grow out in all directions and completely influence the entire society from the bottom up. With this in mind, Malinowski argued, you could understand all aspects of an entire society by starting with one aspect of culture, again, no matter how small, and eventually working your way out. Now, he used that approach with the Trobian Islanders, and he rooted his observations in human biology arguing that the most basic needs of people, food, water, shelter, sex, whatever, are satisfied by culture, 
So culture functions, if you will, to meet those needs. In turn, culture creates instrumental needs or the things people need to do to satisfy cultural practices. So that way, their basic needs are met. And this goes on and on until an entire hierarchy of integrative cultural needs and responses is created, which works like a positive feedback loop to maintain itself. The needs of the Trobrian Islanders, like catching fish and other marine foods, would eventually create entire economic, religious, political, and kinship systems. Now, of this period of anthropology, one of the most celebrated came from the French cultural uh, structural school, Claude Levi Strauss. Now, in a sort of intellectual inheritance from researchers like Adolf Bastian and the aforementioned Edward Tylar, Levi Strauss believed that all humans everywhere and throughout time, as far back as the origin of Homo sapiens at least, possess the same psychology and thus have the potential to approach problems in their environment in much the same ways, what we would call the psychic unity of humankind. Whether somebody lives in the Arctic or Australia, they will look at the world and impose a system of classification to understand their place in the cosmos and among their fellows. And one common way to do that, according to Levi Strauss, is through the recognition of binary oppositions or thinking in dualities. This is where concepts of good versus evil, old versus young, man versus woman came from. And through his research, Levi Strauss argued that you could get to the fundamental beliefs of a society by looking at their myths and deconstructing them until you reach these dualities, which ultimately would reflect upon the wider universal mental unity shared by all peoples. Thus, you learn about one people, you learn about all peoples. Now, in a lengthy multi-year publication called Mythologikis, Levi Strauss surveyed myths from across Native America and claimed to have traced such binary oppositions from pole to pole, showing how they were created, shared, reshared, and traveled across regions to take different forms, but almost always sharing the same underlying themes. Now, uh, before moving on, I must confess that this survey of anthropological history has been necessarily trimmed of fat. And so if you're anticipating me mentioning every key anthropologist in all the eras, I, I wouldn't hold your breath. Um, in subsequent episodes of this season, you know, I, I will return to these and other unmentioned anthropologists to better explore their work as related to different topics. But this is definitely a, a, a brief crash course I'm not trying to be too comprehensive, even if it seems like I am. Um, but let's go to America. We'll, we'll cross into the next slide. Um, and we come across uh, the next coming of age for the field from Lewis Henry Morgan and his peers. And so we are about to meet the Boazians, who founded the School of American Cultural Anthropology at the start of the 20th century. And the name for this group comes from its founder, who is certainly one of the most familiar and well-respected American anthropologists who ever lived. Franz Boas, who was a German immigrant who set up shop as museum curator for the Smithsonian and then as professor at Columbia University. Boas and his students were faced with major challenges during their time in anthropology. On one front, they were desperate to record as many details about the lives, customs, and beliefs of surviving indigenous peoples as possible, as by the 1900s European colonialism and then American imperialism had all but stamped out the original pre-Columbian lifestyles of many Native American groups who are now either assimilated into white American culture or dumped onto reservations. Well, mostly. Hmm. The last unaccounted indigenous person in the United States, uh, named Ishi by anthropologist Alfred Kroeber, was the only survivor of the Yahi Nation of Northern California and was found near emaciated in a barn in 1911 after wandering from his homeland after a brutal genocide. Hmm. Uh, his story and his contribution to anthropology remain enlightening and controversial to this day, but it certainly represents the key mindset of salvage ethnography that permitted the field in America during this time. The Boazians felt that key information about human sociocultural diversity would be lost unless they worked with surviving nations to gather as many records and details of their lives as they could. So Franz Boas, in particular, focused much of his research on Northwest Pacific Coast nations like the Kwakiutl. Now, while this approach has honorable merits, mm. it did seem to play into ideas of cultural death that nowadays are no longer considered valid by anthropologists today, much less indigenous nations themselves who have remained very much culturally alive in their traditional practices 
while also accepting new ones. On another front, the Boazians typically rejected, or at best they underemphasized evolutionary or structuralist ideas that seemed too inductive or tried to explain too many details through a generalizing lens. They had felt that such inductive reasoning reduced the peoples they studied to living fossils and did not reflect upon the role of historical processes in shaping and changing people and their cultures. And their critiques of such approaches were often given to anthropologists who judged societies as primitive or advanced by the ideals of their own parent cultures. So thus, Franz Boas in particular is credited with coining the modern definition and understanding of cultural relativism. Now this, combined with historical particularism, which addressed the inductive evolutionary models the Boasians critiqued, shifted focus on the study of societies and peoples on their own merits, free from ethnocentric judgments, mm. which would then allow the understandings of those societies to be more objective, but never fully, as that's asking too much of anybody. And then, on another front, there was the impact of racist ideologies in America. The Boazians noted that many contemporary anthropologists and others spent way too much time classifying people into racial and mental hierarchies mm -hmm. and promoting their theories on polygenism and intelligence, especially into the Second World War and the rise of Nazism. Through their work, Boaz and colleagues showed and argued just the opposite. Humans were symptoms of their environment and culture as much, if not more so, than genetics, and that human biology was very moldable or plastic, and this included the brain. Human intelligence was not fixed, and the measuring of skulls and their shapes could tell you nothing about abilities or personalities or knowledge. That had more to do with nutrition than with intelligence. And the classification of human races could not be properly qualified, because even within ethnic groups, there was often more diversity than between them. And as such, there were no standards to which different races could achieve civilization and other goals that had previously been argued. People of all races and ethnic groups were capable of achieving any cultural developments they set their minds to. So, right away, the Boazian cultural anthropologists spent decades overturning centuries of bias and convention among anthropologists, as well as in the general public. From Franz Boaz's peers and students came an entire busload of famous and interventional anthropologists. So, we've already mentioned Alfred Kroeber who argued that culture played more of a role in shaping people than specific individuals, because great people only exist at specific periods of history, which promote their greatness. Uh, there's Robert Lowy, who argued that the human ability for culture was not determined by any specific factor, but many working together. There's Paul Radin, who demonstrated how peoples in non-industrial societies had philosophical understandings about life, death, morality, and the nature of reality, of equal style to the greats of Western philosophy. There's Edward Sapir, who pioneered research into linguistics, and his own student, Benjamin Lee Worf, in which languages influence how their speakers think and see the world. Uh, there's Ashley Montague, who did much to dispel myths about race and gender among different human groups. And if we move to the next slide, we have, of course, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, and Zora Neale Hurston. These are probably some of the most famous women in anthropology mm -hmm. and are credited with bringing the field into many people's homes through their publications, which became as bestsellers as any novel. Margaret Mead did her work in Oceania, particularly New Guinea and Samoa, and argued heavily that much of the acquisition of culture was psychological and had nothing to do with heredity. Culture shaped personalities and ways of thinking, and the time of childhood to adolescence was particularly important in establishing the basic and most important aspects of culture in a person, what is known as enculturation, by showing that teenage Samoan women underwent a very untroubled adolescence because they were allowed legroom to be sexually free and unashamed of things like menstruation, contrary to American teenage girls, Mead was able to demonstrate that behaviors in adolescence were not dictated by genetics, but by how children were raised culturally. And in an interesting turn of events, Mead took her research and then offered lessons that American readers could take to improve their lives, as well as reflect on their own ethnocentric ideas about what is normal. Ruth Benedict, a fellow peer and a possible love interest for Mead, uh, 
expanded on her friend's work through her field work in North America and New Guinea to look for common cultural patterns and what they had to say about human psychology. This configurationalism argued that one could uncover cultural personalities that were reflected in all the people who lived in a given society. And this led to some rather interesting categorizations for the people she studied. So the Pueblo and Zuni peoples of the American Southwest were described as Apollonian due to their apparent restraint and peacefulness, while the Quakayutl of the Pacific Northwest were Dionysian because they were excessive and self-absorbed. It odd, I'm sure. But this research would anticipate later studies on national character, which would then have a widespread influence, especially in politics. Hmm. Now, Zora Neale Hurston, who was a direct student of Boaz and one of the stars of the Harlem Renaissance, conducted anthropological research on African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities and revealed many aspects on the role of folklore, as well as sexual exploitation by white men on black women. She often translated her work into novels for public viewing, the most famous of which was the 1937 Their Eyes Were Watching God, which has since been given stage and film adaptations. So that about covers the Boazian school. Um, Albert, do you have any thoughts? Well, uh, this certainly seems like a pretty big step forward in anthropology. I mean, of course, it is kind of misleading to present scientific progress as being you know, linear. Um, but uh, it, it is obvious that this has been a very influential uh, movement to this day. Some of the ideas that were held back then uh, would still be considered flawed by, by our standards today, but uh, clearly... I think uh, they they really seem to have laid the groundwork for kind of um, much greater equality and collaboration in these fields of study. Absolutely. Yeah. And and, I mean, their influence cannot be understated for sure. Um, Especially in an age nowadays where American culture is everywhere now. Mm -hmm. Um, It stands to reason that those methods of anthropology are going to spread too. But let's move to the next slide now. And uh, so while the French, British, and American school of sociocultural anthropology often get the the top billing in histories of the field as a whole, I I think it's easy to forget that there were other schools that popped up around the world, often directly influenced or inspired by Euro-American institutions. So I I wanted to try to do my best to highlight some of these, at least for this um, crash course of anthropological theory. So modern Chinese anthropology began just before the 1920s, after translations of Lewis Henry Morgan's works arrived in the country. Along with these came Chinese students who had studied abroad and brought what they learned with them. Chai Yuanpei was born in Shaoxing, but studied in Germany, where he was interested in the field of ethnology. He published an article in 1926 in which he laid out his arguments that the study and comparison of cultures was best served under the methods of ethnography rather than other anthropological methods. Not long after, Yuan Pei was given a position at the head of the Ethnology Division of the Research Institute of Social Sciences, one of many such anthropological institutes established by the Chinese government in the late 1920s. From there, Yuan Pei would go on toward many projects, from reforms in educational methods to the liberalization of women in Chinese society. Once established, the researchers of these institutes began to conduct some of the first ethnographic studies of Chinese people from across many minority ethnic groups, including those in Taiwan, as well as the majority ethnic groups, like their fellow Han Chinese, uh, in which are known as community studies, or Yeshu Yuanshu. This sort of research framed communities as groups of people not defined by genes or geography, but rather as subsections within larger populations. And one of the key players in this field of research was Wu Wenzhou, who studied in New Hampshire and New York before returning to China. Wen Zhao was interested in rural sociology, which means looking at different small-scale societies and comparing them so that larger models could be developed to explain their overarching commonalities, as starting with larger-scale societies would hinder the process with too many complexities to account for. Given the events in China throughout the early half of the 20th century, it is important to note that the results of anthropology for some of these researchers would be used to help modernize the country through inserting state communist policies. Um, But when the Maoist era began, all the anthropological schools were abolished or subsumed into other educational departments 
only to return in the 1980s and reform itself to tackle less ideologically minded projects. Similarly, Russian anthropology during the Soviet era was used for political means. Only after 1946, when anthropologists who had used Western-style methods in their research were fired or disposed of. Of those that remained, we find Nikolai Butinov, whose main academic projects were involved in Oceania. Butinov was interested in the study of growth and development, and as a Marxist, rejected the psychological connections towards culture espoused by the Boazians. He, alongside a peer, Yuri Kornerzov, played roles in the decipherment of the Maya and Rongo Rongo scripts, the latter of which has yet to be fully translated even today. And then there was Alexander Reshetov, who published widely on Russian as well as East and Southeast Asian history and ethnography. He was also important in preserving the legacy of pre-Soviet anthropologists by collecting their works and later publishing small biographies of their life and study. After Soviet Russia began to re-establish connections with the world in the late 1950s, scholarly connections between Russian and foreign anthropologists could begin again, and there was a concerted effort to combine the prose of Russian anthropology with those in America and elsewhere, including the recognition of anti-racist and culturally relativist ideals. Um, but there were still ideological conflicts regarding structural anthropology that would permeate into recent times. Now, when we look at Latin American anthropology, which is also a product of the 20th century, we find that the field has been at the forefront of social and political issues. As researchers worked to build up their countries, their approaches to anthropology were mainly directed inward, almost self-reflective. Now, this has inevitably led to tensions in Latin American communities, uh, as different schools of anthropology have mainly manifested as Euro-American or Black or Native traditions, which is certainly understandable considering the long history of colonization in Central and South America, but uh, many I will highlight too. During the 1940s, one of the most influential anthropologists in Brazil introduced and standardized theories and practices that lasted generations. Emilio Willems, studying in Germany under the sociology of Max Weber and colleagues, took up teaching as one of the first professors of anthropology in the entire country. Through his fieldwork in Brazilian rural communities, Willems further established and expanded on theories of acculturation, or how immigrants into foreign societies integrate into those societies while also keeping their own traditions. Certainly in a country like Brazil, there's much to learn from this. In Mexico, at the same time, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran was conducting field work with Afro-Mexican and Amerindian groups in his home country, where he had also gotten his education. Though he started in medicine, Beltran would apply his medical lessons to anthropology and applied his research towards benefiting Mexican communities, particularly indigenous ones. Now, this applied anthropology has become one of the most crucial and important aspects of the field today. Hmm. It is no longer considered ethical to simply drop down and study a people and then whisk away into academia to publish papers. Now, anthropologists have been working very closely with and giving back to their studied communities, whether that be sharing research or implementing new approaches to their re uh, from their research to help foster positive change. Now, the history of anthropology in Africa is a perfect example of how such changes in anthropological methods have occurred through very dramatic means. From the time of modern European contact, anthropology was the domain of colonists and the missionaries they brought with them. They recorded the lives of the people they studied as they worked to subjugate and convert them. But by the 1950s, as decolonization was underway, European-style universities had cropped up in several countries and introduced structuralism and functionalism as anthropological theories to practice for their students. And a whole new world of understanding for oral histories and cultural traditions in Africa began to take root. And by the 1960s, African-born anthropologists were taking the field and molding it to understand their own worlds and oppose centuries of colonialism. Blending the very same Marxism that helped overthrow European empires, these anthropologists challenged the status quo and reasserted themselves and their fellow Africans as equal players on the world's intellectual stage. To highlight one amazing individual, I would like to draw attention to Archie Mafeje from South Africa. Given the fact that until the 1990s, South Africa was ruled by apartheid, he underwent a busy and often turbulent childhood. He was born as a member of the Mupondomzi people, 
of the Chosa in 1936. Mafege went to school and was introduced to Marxist concepts through the non-European unity movement before going on to study as three consecutive universities in the country, where he graduated with bachelors in social and political anthropology. His early fieldwork culminated in a doctoral thesis on the farmers of Buganda, uh, having firmly rejected European-style anthropological methods. When he was given a job as a lecturer in social anthropology for the University of Cape Town in 1967, there was an uproar because under apartheid, the government forced Mafeje to resign despite there being no law against hiring black professors, mm. which led to massive protests, which went from local to global in scope. By 1969, he was able to be a lecturer, but at another university in Tanzania. Almost immediately, however, he was injured in a car accident and had to undergo surgeries in Europe, where he stayed for several years as a professor, and his influence helped lead to the creation of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa whose goal carried on the modern concept of applied anthropology across the continent. Mafeje continued uh, to travel frequently from Cairo to Zimbabwe to Namibia to the United States, all the while supporting and arguing for pan-Africanist activism, decolonization of African anthropology, and critiquing the study of ethnography to recognize the power dynamics between ethnographers and their subjects, and to encourage a more dialogue-based and collaborative approach with better outcomes for the communities under study. It is in these and in many other regions of the world that the hand of anthropology has touched. And nowadays there are anthropological scholars, field researchers, archeologists, folklorists, and, and more in just about every country on earth, often bringing their own cultural perspectives and thus increasing the power of knowledge and practice in the field. Uh, do you have any thoughts, uh, Albert? Wow. Uh... I mean, we're, we're coming up to a point where we are talking about individuals who have been contemporary with us and uh, like us as, as individuals. Um, so, yeah, it is it is quite eye opening to, to see like the, the journey to, to get here. And, and you're right, like uh, we're talking about the history of scientific research. It's really easy to be very eurocentric and american centric um so i'm really glad that you decide to to highlight uh, many of these uh, people and schools of thought here uh because i definitely wasn't familiar with with most of these uh before um so yeah what, what an astounding uh, journey so far and uh you definitely see the influence of globalization as well uh, in these developments absolutely and that's something that i wanted to change for this series because in all of my resources, like my initial resources for uh, researching this episode, you know, the issues of anthropological theory, and there are many, um, they are heavily biased against European and American sources. Um, so I actually had to kind of go out of my way to research many of these individuals that, you know, I've learned about all of them for the very first time. And uh, it's very eye opening, and it helps kind of bring the field into a more holistic understanding, I think. Definitely. But let's move on now to the next slide. And, uh, We'll shift focus towards the later half of the 20th century, where we continue to see major shifts across the fields of anthropology as the old methods of cultural evolution, functionalism, structuralism, and the classic Boazian school were beginning to show their age mm. and inability to catch up with the massive increase in new information as well as techniques. So even though cultural evolution fell out of fashion for much of the early 20th century, especially through the work of the American Boazians, by the 1950s, it had essentially re-emerged under a new paradigm. So just as biology underwent its modern evolutionary synthesis, so too did cultural anthropology undergo the emergence of neo-evolutionism. Hmm. The head of this new change were two American anthropologists, Leslie White and Julian Stewart, who recognized, as early researchers didn't, that evolution was not a unilinear process from simple to complex, but rather a continuous process that simply allowed features of societies to remain, change, diversify, or fall out, depending upon their survivability and purpose within communities. In their books, The Evolution of Culture and Theory of Cultural Change, White and Stewart took a sharp eye on the growing archeological and paleoanthropological research that outlined how humans and their cultures changed over time. They outlined two types of cultural evolution, a general evolution, as observed from the shift from foraging to farming communities across the world, mm 
and a multilinear evolution, which explained how different societies could convergently evolve similar practices, as seen in the emergence of farming and sedentism in various places unconnected to each other. Leslie and Stewart were very interested in finding the causes for cultural evolution, and their theories tended to emphasize the environments or technological changes or the capture of energy. Uh, and they would not be the only neo-evolutionists. We owe much of this new field to anthropologists like Elman Service, who developed a model of the evolution of socio-political organization that would replace the racist and ethnocentric savage to barbarian to civilized classification towards a more systematic bands to tribes to chiefdoms to states classification. Within archaeology and paleoanthropology, exciting changes and discoveries were underway that often supported these new late 20th century schools of anthropology. In the former, we find the work of an Australian archaeologist, V. Gordon Childe, who revolutionized study of agricultural origins and prehistory through his research on the relative speed of historical revolutions. Childe argued that there was clear evidence in the archaeological record to show that humans around the world underwent a Neolithic and then an urban revolution, uh, completely shifting their life ways towards the domestication and use of crops and livestock, and then towards town and city life and organization. Lewis Binford, an American archaeologist, was the pioneer of ethno-archaeology, so using the study of living non-industrial peoples to understand prehistoric peoples, um, in this case performing fieldwork with Arctic peoples to gain insights into the lives of Paleolithic Europeans. In paleoanthropology, the increased speed at which stone industries and new fossils of hominins, like the Australopith Lucy and the Erectine Turkana boy, were found, led to near-complete overhauls in models of human evolution, both biological and cultural. And these were often supplemented by new ethnographic and primatological research. Um, two notable examples are the roles Jane Goodall and Louis Leakey played in the 1960s, showing that non-human primates made and used tools and just how far back the evolution of culture might have gone, um, as well as the discussions on the deep evolution of religion and spirituality that were inspired by the discovery of the Neanderthal burial sites in Shanidar, Iraq, at the same time. And there were new insights in genetics and human physical biology that were illuminating the true nature of human diversity further away from the old racist models. Now, perhaps more than ever, Different subfields of anthropology collaborated together to tell the full story of human evolution, not just in the distant past, but in more recent times. And even so, there would always be those taking a step back. At the same time, different fields attempted to influence anthropology through their research, often leaving more of a mess than they found. You had the fledgling field of human ethology, or the study of human behavior, which had started innocently enough to understand the and find underlying universals in human behavior and whether they had genetic causes. But often such research read beyond the data and still others managed to include personal and social biases anyway in attempts to provide that so-called evidence-based justifications for varied social ills that had been in place since medieval times. Um, we see this work in, uh, in such uh, researchers like Arthur Jensen and and Bill Murray, and even Edward Wilson, uh, which promoted ideas that specific human behaviors could be characterized by particular genes, which were exclusive to certain racial groups or sexes. Now, needless to say, such work has since been heavily criticized, and its results debunked with thorough explanations and further research, which we will certainly get to in, in this series. One anthropologist who did much to respond to that work was an American called Marshall Sollins, who began his career studying cultural evolution alongside Elman Service, but later devoted much of his work towards economics and historical processes. Through fieldwork in the South Pacific, Sollins provides two interesting perspectives on traditional human societies. One was that economics could be best studied through the substantivist models, which argued that typical Euro-American style understandings of money, goods, and services would not work for non-industrial indigenous societies, which could better be understood through their cultures and what they distinguished as valuable. If society did not recognize rich or poor individuals, it would not make sense to study them under such concepts. Now, the other perspective was on the understanding of rationality, 
having different forms under different cultural traditions. Uh, a clear lesson applied for cultural relativism, and used particularly strongly in a 1985 debate with a Sri Lankan anthropologist, Gayanath Obeskere, over whether indigenous peoples, in this case from Hawaii in the time of James Cook, should be considered as having the same rationality as Europeans, or whether both groups had their own ideas and ideals of rational thought. Salins is one of the few anthropologists thus far discussed who only passed away relatively recently, uh, leaving us with a posthumous book in 2022 about religious anthropology called The New Science of the Enchanted Universe, which I have not yet read, but I'm certainly very interested in checking out. Um, of interest to highlight for this period is Clifford Gertz, another American anthropologist. His research followed another new intellectual tradition in the field of symbolic anthropology which studied symbols and their role in society. Uh, this was pioneered by a Scottish anthropologist, Victor Turner, uh, and the field would combine its research with psychology to argue that symbols could be used like tools in rituals as means to an end and implant meaning at wider cultural levels as well as individual ones. Gertz, however, sought much deeper into the specific representation of symbols or semiotics. In this way, he was a pioneer of interpretive anthropology and argued for more detailed and descriptive ethnographic texts, which would better illuminate and interpret the meaning behind varied cultural symbols. In his 1973 book, The Interpretation of Cultures, he noted the example of cockfights in Bali and how the fighting of roosters was itself symbolic of Balinese culture, which emphasized competition by individuals for established ranks. Just as two roosters of equal standing would make for a powerful match, so too would two individuals of equal rank have dramatic meaning for their fellows in society. While the interpretive school of thought has fallen by the wayside somewhat, it is still recognized for setting better standards in writing ethnography. The rise of second wave feminism also played a necessary role in shaping anthropology, as it shifted much of the field's obsession with studying the men of society towards a more nuanced and equal representative study of women and men, young and old, across genders. In so doing, it illuminated aspects of human cultural diversity and evolution that had gone unappreciated or unknown until this point. Now, one pivotal feminist anthropologist is, for she is still active today, Sarah Blaffer Hardy, an American. She did much of her field work not just on humans but on other primates, like Langers, and came to draw comparisons between species. Through her work, Hardy argued that the role of mothers, grandmothers, and other women in social groups was underemphasized in traditional understandings, and that they play and have played very important roles in nurturing the next generation through cooperative breeding. Explained simply, non-breeding females or allo mothers helped raise the children of breeding females and so allowed the latter to continue supporting the overall group. Infants would be raised by multiple individuals and so gained key insights and skills necessary to live and cooperate in such hypersocial groups as humans have, which may have set hominins apart from the other primates. Um, another key feminist anthropologist is Marilyn Strathern, whose fieldwork in Papua New Guinea demonstrated how Euro-American gender norms were not standard across human societies worldwide. And of course, there were modern and postmodern approaches to anthropology, which contributed their own insights, most notably revealing the apparent subjectivity in the majority of anthropological research across time, and the need to challenge the authoritative tone of the field itself. Now, a great benefit of this is that various indigenous anthropologists have advocated for other forms of knowledge, which brings a truly holistic approach to understanding a people and its culture. Um, do you have any thoughts, Al? I, I think uh, certainly in, in many ways, I mean, you, you already drew parallels to the history of studying biological evolution, but that's certainly very apparent here, uh, down to many of the early misconceptions about cultural evolution, also being similar to um, early misconceptions that were held about um, evolution uh, in organisms as well. Uh, so, yeah, it is interesting to see all these fields going through their um, their own revolutions, I suppose. Absolutely. And just the interconnectedness too. Mm -hmm. um, all these different schools coming together even more now than they did in the past and you know, creating new knowledge. Um, and speaking of which, if we move to the next slide, um, we're now into the 21st century. Um, and up until now and even beyond, 
anthropology continues to change and reinvent itself, bringing new insights through not only new field research, but also new ways of conducting that research in a digital hyper-globalized age. So in response to the digital age, anthropologists have now set their sights on the internet and its role in shaping humans and their cultures today. There are now digital anthropologists who study online communities and their interactions, whether through social media platforms or virtual reality settings. Applying that very same mindset of cultural relativism, these researchers do not look at the internet landscape as inherently good or bad as a medium for human interactions. They instead approach the topic with curiosity. What do these areas of communication, so new as they are, have to say about how people perceive reality and how people develop new social groups and movements or how people seek employment or status? Because in many ways, the internet has proven to be a mirror on how people have behaved in pre-digital times. Only this time, the pace of sociocultural change is much faster. And it's in just over 30 years since the launching of the World Wide Web. Now, on more traditional non-digital worlds, the methods and philosophy of applied anthropology have given rise to public anthropology, which further facilitates the relationship between academics and the wider non-specialist public. As explained by an American anthropologist, Julia Morris, quote, anthropology should not just be about the academic pursuit of knowledge, but also a means to engage diverse publics in practical and at times political ways, end quote. So whether that be through creating films to showcase their work, to engaging in activist protests, public anthropologists are now participating in deep conversations with the communities they study to evaluate and critique the field itself and redefine what it means to do anthropology. And I think one powerful example comes from an Indian anthropologist, uh, Gayatri Spivak, whose 1988 speech, Can the Subaltern Speak?, resonates deeply today, advocating that impoverished communities should be allowed to speak for themselves about their experiences, rather than let others speak for them, which gives the impression that the plight of the impoverished can only be given serious priority when it comes from an outside academic source. And then there's cultural resource management, which really began to come into its own in the 1970s and beyond. CRM is exactly as it sounds. You were managing sociocultural resources from materials and artworks to architecture and areas of land to languages and preserving them for the relevant societies for future generations. It can function for any type of culture, traditional or contemporary, and often works very closely with the people who own said culture to ensure that these resources are not destroyed or altered beyond recognition. Such work in keeping global cultural heritage alive has been manifesting in a surprising new place, archaeology. There are now many new methods of archaeology that seek to minimize as much damage as possible. For example, through remote sensing and LIDAR, or light detection and ranging, whole sites for hundreds of kilometers can be scanned and recorded from the air to detect hidden structures or place archaeological sites in a wider context. And as such, nowadays, there's very little penetrative excavation that goes on anymore. And sites, especially indigenous ones, um, can be better preserved, respected, and protected. And the possibilities of exploring the past are even greater now thanks to the genetics revolution. Ever since the initial sequencing of the human genome in 1990, and the discovery of the first ancient DNA in 1984, which is from a quagga, which is an extinct subspecies of plain zebra, anthropologists in the biological and archaeology subfields can now gain new insights into the origin, evolution, and lifeways of lost peoples and places that they could never have gleaned from traditional excavations alone. It's now possible to reconstruct pedigrees and evolutionary trees for humans going back hundreds of thousands of years, and we can even discover clues to the nutrition and kinship customs of specific individuals. Now, the future of anthropology is fascinating to consider, but I think one thing that is certain is that the field will remain relevant for as long as there are humans to study. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what do you think about that, Albert? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would agree. Uh, as long as there are humans, uh, humans are always going to be wondering about humans and wanting to learn more about humans and, by extension, themselves. Um, so I, I think that's a very reasonable guess. Um, and certainly uh, a lot of these uh, recent advances are pretty familiar um, to us in other scientific fields too, uh, like in paleontology, which of course is kind of an adjacent um, 
field. Uh, there is now such a thing as molecular paleontology, which we would never have imagined, um, you know, just a few decades ago. Uh, and kind of non-destructive methods of sampling are also now increasingly being used in paleontology as well. Um, yeah, this has been a really good look back at the history of anthropology. Um, I, I I like how you framed this uh, this journey. I, I suppose uh, since you, you called you called this episode learning, um, and it's not just about uh, learning it in itself, but also about how humans have learned about uh, humans. And learning is one of those things that is part of what makes us human, isn't it? Like, uh, of course, it is not unique to humans. We have copious evidence that. Um, many other types of animals are also capable of learning, uh, even things like certain types of insects, which we have talked about on the show before. But uh, certainly without learning, we definitely would not be where we are today. Um, and that's something that uh, is worth celebrating, really. <laughs> so this, this, is, this has been very cool. <laughs> Thank you. And it's true. I mean, not just so much learning about themselves, but learning about how to learn about themselves exactly, too. Yeah. <laughs> I think is a really yeah, big lesson in anthropology. And speaking of learning, if we move to the next slide, um, we have some lessons that I think we can learn ourselves. So moving forward with this series, it will be good to have a rough outline of this history in the back of our minds as we discuss what the findings of anthropology have to tell us about everything from sustenance and technology to kinship and ritual. There's a rich history of anthropological theory, some old, some new, and in the 21st century, some of that has fallen by the wayside. Some has been revived and tweaked to fit current understandings, and some have stood the test of time. So as we go through each episode, we're going to revisit some of these big names and their ideas in more detail to better explain what we know about human social, cultural diversity and evolution, as is the main theme of this season. Now, that said, what are some things that we can take away from the history of anthropology and its findings? What lessons about the field as a whole have particular relevance for us, and what should we take to heart? So the first major lesson, I would argue, is that humans evolved and have a deep history. Even beyond the time when our species Homo sapiens had uh, originated some 300,000 years ago or more, humans were the end result of thousands upon thousands of generations of hominin evolution and billions of years of biological evolution going back to the origins of the cosmos. And we carry the evidence for this deep ancestry within our bodies. And we see it as well in the world around us. Nothing about the human story makes sense without our understanding of evolution and of deep time. And we are connected to everything around us because of that. And so the second major lesson is that humans are cultural animals and that culture permeates just about everything that we do. We are a cooperative species descended from social animals. And the thing about living in a group is that you have to learn to live and work together, at least in theory. We know that rudimentary elements of culture exist in our closest relatives and beyond, and that cultural practices often maintain our ability to live and work together. Not always, but often. A culture, no matter how bizarre or elaborate or even counterintuitive, is the root cause of almost everything found in our global societies. And the third major lesson in that is that cultures are not static. Cultures change, and depending on the historical circumstances, this can happen slowly or quickly. You'll often hear some people talk about French culture or Islamic culture or Pacific Islander culture. I think these are misleading and inaccurate terms. Mm. Cultures are far more specific than this and are a hell of a lot more context dependent depending on what period of time you're examining. Fran France as a nation could be dated as far back as 66 or 232 or 1,181 years ago. Mm. It's people's boundaries, policies, and life ways having changed in that time. Islam was founded 1,414 years ago in Mecca but has in that time traveled out to the entire world and adapted itself to regions as widespread as Malaysia and Montana. And the Pacific Islands span over 30,000 islands and hundreds of ethnic groups, mm -hmm. some sharing a common ancestry, some not. So culture is singular and plural, and it changes with time. Now, the fourth major lesson, I would say, 
is that good anthropology is conducted under the lens of cultural relativism. Now, I mentioned I would bring this up again. A lot of ink has been spilled about cultural relativism. And much of it, even by anthropologists sometimes, is misunderstood. So according to Matthew Engelk, in his wonderful book, How to Think Like an Anthropologist, quote, cultural relativism is a critical self-awareness that your own terms of analysis, understanding, and judgment are not universal and cannot be taken for granted, end quote. It is thus a tool for studying peoples and their cultures that is as objective and unbiased as possible so as to not taint your results. So that being said, cultural, uh, cultural relativism doesn't mean that there are no morals or that morals ultimately have no value or that they all have equal value. Um, as an anthropologist or as an enthusiast for learning about the world, you don't have to believe or accept or ultimately deny and dismiss every single thing about a given people or their society's beliefs and practices. Cultural relativism is simply a way to study humans and understand them accurately. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, the fifth major lesson is that good social cultural anthropology is mainly done through fieldwork. Since Herodotus and Al Biruni, anthropologists and their ancestors have learned about other people by living and communicating with them. And that can go as far as necessary. You participate in their meals, their chores, their rituals. You learn the nuances of their language. You familiarize yourself with their surrounding landscape. And you discuss the big questions openly and honestly. And with as many members of the community as possible, not just the men or even the adult men. Save for armchair anthropologists, which I understand are still around somewhat and still do very important work, almost every sociocultural anthropologist has lived with another society for at least a year. And the fruits of their interpersonal skills and journalism have given us the entire spectrum of contemporary human experience in written form. And that's not something to shake a stick at, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, the sixth major lesson, and the last that I would give for now, personally, is that human sociocultural diversity is important to our survival. That spectrum of human experience is more valuable when its components are still around to share the world together. All of human history is groups coming together, sharing ideas, and building something new from them, especially when challenges emerge that threaten us. Every idea around today is the child of thousands of these interactions, and that same process continues to create new ideas even today, and will do so in the future. And the combination of not just ideas, but life experiences, perspectives, beliefs, and art forms, is the engine that makes human life and culture so powerful. Our dear friend Meg Dixon has said that diversity is necessary for survival. And this understanding has come in part through their research on the history of life on Earth. Slaves of organisms that have undergone adaptive radiations or have at least spread out across the world and evolved into myriad forms tend to have a better chance of surviving mass extinction events than clades that have low diversity. As with our fellow beings on this earth, humans have flourished best when their social cultural diversity has been high. Cultural homogeneity has time and again tended to lead to great pain, destruction, and suffering, especially when it becomes imposed from centralized governments. We just cannot face the big challenges of the Anthropocene event without a multitude of diverse cultural practices and ideas, as people throughout time have faced similar and sometimes smaller challenges, and more often than not have succeeded in whatever small way possible. And so I think it's these lessons, and perhaps many more, that make anthropology so special. And it is the incredible diversity of human sociocultural experience that we're going to celebrate in this new season. And so, Albert, do you have any closing thoughts for us? Well, I, I don't think I could put it any better than you already have, really. But uh, these are definitely very important lessons to take away with us uh, as we study anthropology. And really not just that. I think uh, in our day-to-day -day lives, just um, kind of living alongside other people and uh, getting to know other people, I think all of these things are uh, worth having, having there in the back of your head. Uh, so... Uh, I'm definitely uh, interested to see uh, where these lessons will take us as we continue this series. Absolutely.
And where are we going next with this series? Well, let's jump over to the next slide for our, our preview. Mm -hmm. As we've been doing in the last season, we will continue to do here. So in the next installment, what I'm going to call Ancestry, mm -hmm. we will explore humans within the Tree of Life, tracing the thread of human evolution from its earliest stages to right before the split between the last common ancestor of Pan and Homo. And along the way, we'll see how our ancestors' bodies changed from unicellular to multicellular, from aquatic to terrestrial, and from rough-skinned to furry, describing the key transitions that gave us the first hominins. And this will certainly be familiar territory for the both of us, mm -hmm. but otherwise, that is it for our season premiere of Humanity a Prologue. Um, let's go ahead now to our regular acknowledgements. So, we are on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash time and clades. This is a website where you can give monetary donations, however small, and those contributions would help continue the series and develop new projects and expansions. And Patreon is fun in that if you so choose to want to support us, there are special perks you can get. Uh, you can get special shout outs for episodes. You can suggest questions that we can answer. You can even suggest episodes that we can do and, and we'll look into it. Um, so for example, uh, we have several patrons now that are of a certain tier where they are owed shout outs. So I wanna thank my, uh, my sister, Julie, our good friends, Paul, Denver, Frankish, uh, Tristan and Val Denunzio. So thank you all so much for your support. It, it means the world to us. Um, of course, in terms of our regular acknowledgements, I uh, wanna thank our good friends, Henry and Alicia, for their contributions to this series. Henry is responsible for the wonderful theme music that opens each episode. And Alicia is responsible for the color scheme of Albert's Alversor avatar. A cheery little fellow. Um, of course, we are still on Twitter. We are at Time and Clates, where we will typically be uploading episodes as they are released. Though most likely you will probably be watching us on our YouTube page through Time and Clades. Um, so if you're interested in liking and subscribing and clicking for notifications, we certainly encourage that. Um, if you have any questions about the show, whether it be about the history of, of anthropological theory, as I have just discussed, or any of the individuals, or anything at all, there's three ways you can reach us. You can send us an email, timeandclades at gmail.com. You can leave a YouTube comment, or you can tweet at us. And we will almost certainly get those and respond in kind. Now, uh, I have numerous resources that I've used to create this episode. So if you're interested in reading a little bit deeper into anthropological theory, as well as in some of the websites and, and books that I have found to help illuminate some of these individuals, um, I will put all of that in a special document in the description below, where you can check out and do your own research from there. Because as always in these series, I don't want you to just take my word for it, even though I do as much as I can to put research into it. It's sometimes good to validate and confirm and do your own research. And who knows, maybe you too will learn more about cultural anthropology than you would have expected. And like, I hope you may have learned something new today in this episode. Um, but with that, we want to thank you all so much for joining us for the season premiere of Humanity of Prologue, season two. It's going to be a great 17 episodes. I can't wait. And we hope you'll join us all for the journey. Mm -hmm. So until then, have a wonderful day. Take care, everybody.